Welcome. I'm Paul Davis, this morning's worship associate. We ring this bell three times. The first time is to honor those who have come before us, from whom we learn, from whom we have received blessings, especially the Ohlone people, stewards of this land. The second time is to call us into relationship with each other and to with all humankind living at the present time, that we may grow in and share wisdom and compassion. The third calls us into relationship to those who will come after us, including our children and our children's children to 10 and 100 generations. May we leave them world and knowledge to their benefit. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest minister for this morning, the Reverend Dr. Jeannie Foster, uh, who will be serving us uh, this morning while our Reverend Greg Ward is on vacation. She grew up in New Orleans. Um, she is Professor Emerita at St. Mary's College of California. She is also a Unitarian Universalist minister the former minister of the Unitarian Universalist Society of Modesto. Her poems have appeared in numerous journals. Among them are Hudson Review, The Southern Review, APR, Narrative Magazine, Paris Review. Her first poetry book, A Blessing of Safe Travel, won the Quarterly Review of Literature Poetry Award. And her latest book of poems, Goodbye Silver Sister, was released by Northwestern University Press. Among her other books are Appetite, Food as a Metaphor, an anthology of poems by women and a critical work, A Music of Grace, the Sacred in Contemporary American Poetry, which asks the question, is there still sacred ground to stand on? She is co-translator of The Living Theater, Selected Poems, of Bianca Tarosi, which won the Northern California Book Award for Poetry and Translation. She's received grants from New York State Creative Artists Public Service Foundation, McDowell Colony, Tulane University Poet in Residence, St. Lawrence Foundation, and Lannan Foundation. She currently sings in the choir and has served as a worship associate at UUCB. To be here. We will hear more from her later. To call us to worship, I am reading the words of Lao Tzu, which is number 602 in the back of our hymnal, but I will be reading all the words. If there is to be peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. If there is to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. If there is to be peace in the cities, there must be peace between neighbors. If there is to be peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. If there is to be peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. Come, let us now use this peace from our heart as we worship together. Good morning. Welcome to Mission Peak Unitarian Universalist Congregation. My name is Melissa Holmes and I'm a member of the board. We're so glad you've joined us this morning. Unitarian Universalism is a radically inclusive, non-doctrinal, non-dogmatic, open-minded and open-hearted faith. We are people who are all coming at truth from different paths. We gather together with different experiences, identities and passions because we are sure that everyone has inherent worth and we are all better together than apart. Together we see our job is to love the hate out of this world, to heal the hurt in ourselves and one another, and to be the change we'd like to see in the world. We use the chat to share joys and concerns, 
personal milestones of importance, which will be read aloud in the service. Maybe you're here for the first time. We've been reaching out and asking people to bring their friends because we think the world, especially now, needs some friendly places to gather and find encouragement and hope. We have coffee hour after the service where we get to visit with one another in breakout rooms. Please stick around and visit. We'd love to hear how you've been doing in what has certainly been a challenging time. The worship host will give you more information about this immediately after the service. In the meantime, if you'd like to get more information about the myriad of other things going on all through the week, we invite you to look at our weekly newsletter. Please join anything that speaks to you. If you'd like to have the newsletter sent to you electronically, please send us an email at welcome at mpuuc.org. There are a few things I'd especially like to call your attention to. There's information about our safety policy in the order of service that I encourage you to read. Also, Reverend Barbara Myers is providing pastoral care while Reverend Greg is on study leave. However, Reverend Barbara is on retreat starting today through August 13th. While she is on retreat, please contact a member of the encouragement team. You can look in the order of service or the week on the peak for more information. And if you hear some or see something in this morning service that inspires you or makes you laugh or brings you hope, please tweet it or share it on social media or just tell a friend. We are trying to start a wave of love and justice with every gathering. Please join me now in reading in unison our chalice lighting words, which will shortly appear on the screen.
maybe not that shortly. We light this chalice to remind ourselves to all kindly because we are all one family to take good care of the earth because it is our home. To live lives full of goodness and love because that is how we will become the best people we can be. For our time for all ages this morning, let me put my reading glasses on. A story entitled Butterflies, which is a Tohono O'odham creation account, as published in American Indian Myths and Legends, selected and edited by Richard er Erdoas and Alfonso Ortiz. Uh, the o Tohono O'odham, formerly called Papago, live in the Sonoran Desert area of Southern Arizona and Northern Sonora. One day, the creator was resting, sitting, watching some children play at play in a village. The children laughed and sang, yet as he watched them, the creator her, the creator's heart was sad. He was thinking, these children will grow old. Their skin will become wrinkled. Their hair will turn to gray. Their teeth will fall out. The young hunter's arm will fail. These lovely young girls will grow ugly and fat. The playful puppies will become blind mangy dogs and those wonderful flowers, yellow and blue, red and purple will fade. The leaves from the trees will fall and dry up. Already they are turning yellow. Thus the creator grew sadder and sadder. It was in the fall, and the thought of the coming winter with its cold and lack of game and green things made his heart heavy. Yet it was still warm and the sun was shining. The creator watched the play of sunlight and shadow on the ground, the yellow leaves being carried here and there by the wind. He saw the blueness of the sky the whiteness of some cornmeal ground by the women. Suddenly he smiled. All those colors, they ought to be preserved. I'll make something to gladden my heart, something for these children to look at and enjoy. The creator took out his bag and started gathering things, a spot of sunlight and handful of blue from the sky, the whiteness of the cornmeal, the shadow of playing children, the blackness of a beautiful girl's hair, the yellow of the following leaves, the green of the pine needles, the red, purple, and orange of the flowers around him. All these he put into his bag. As an afterthought, he put the songs of the birds in too. Then he walked over to the grassy spot where the children were playing. Children, little children, this is for you. And he gave them his bag. Open it, there's something nice inside, he told them. The children opened the bag and at once hundreds and hundreds of colored butterflies flew out, dancing around the children's heads, settling on their hair, fluttering up again to sip from this or that flower. And the children, enchanted, said that they had never seen anything so beautiful. The butterflies began to sing and the children listened, smiling. But then a songbird came flying, settling on the creator's shoulder, scolding him, saying, it's not right to give our songs to these new pretty things. You told us when you made us that every bird would have his own song. And now you've passed them all around. Isn't it enough that you gave your new playthings the colors of the rainbow? You're right, said the creator. I made one song for each bird and I shouldn't have taken what belongs to you. So the creator took the songs away from the butterflies and that's why they are silent. They're beautiful, even so, he said. I 
I think we have more butterfly pictures than I have words to read. That's fine, they're cuter. <laughs> and now we have a uh, presentation from Kathy Bain. This is a special offering Sunday. So you have the opportunity uh, to make a special donation in addition to a regular contribution or pledge. I will explain how later. Now, Kathy Bain. <laughs> Good morning. I've been asked to speak on behalf of our Arrow Anti-Racist Anti-Oppression Committee to ask you to contribute this Sunday to support Mission Peak UU Congregation's Eighth Principle Project. The Eighth Principle Project is an effort to add another principle to the official seven principles of Unitarian Universalism. The new principle would focus on the responsibility of UUs to fight racism and other oppressions. The official process by which a new principle is added will result in votes at two general assemblies, one in 2023 and one in 2024. In the meantime, there's a grassroots effort by many congregations to approve the eighth principle right away. So far over 118 congregations have approved the eighth principle. Our Mission Peak UU Arrow Committee intends to take this church year to educate ourselves and our congregation about the eighth principle so we can vote on supporting this principle next June. The money that we contribute today will help us invite speakers and purchase educational materials to make this happen. Thank you so much for your support. We come together every Sunday and all throughout the week for more than ourselves. We come to support one another and the ministries that infuse worth and dignity into our children, our youth, our programs of learning and leadership, and our ministries in the larger world, including our efforts toward anti-racism and anti-oppression. Please make a contribution toward these worthy causes by mailing your check to Mission Peak UU Congregation at the address on the screen, you can also use the bill pay option in your online banking or drop your check in to the Mission Peak mail slot or pay online with a credit or debit card. Uh, and this Sunday, if you wish a contribution to go to the special appeal, put ARO in the memo line. If it is your pledge, put pledge in the memo line so that we can properly account them. Thank you for supporting and sustaining the efforts of our members, friends, and staff. Your contributions make loving, learning, and leadership more possible. One of the things that allows us to find hope and meaning, especially in the hard times, is the love and support we show one another. If you have a joy or concern that by sharing with this caring community might bring the encouragement or resilience you're needing, please write it briefly now in the chat uh, directed to everyone. This is for public joys and concerns. If your need is personal, you can also send an email to our minister or to our encouragement committee for a follow-up conversation. While we are entering our joys and concerns, we will hear more music from Jay and Jessica, and then I will be reading the joys and concerns.
We have the following joys and concerns from the, uh, from the chat. Uh, from Gail Tupper and Eric Dittmer. Uh, joy, question mark. Eric injured fingers on both hands last weekend. He has stitches, but is doing well, and we're both glad it isn't worse. From Colleen Arnold. My sister, who has an inoperable brain tumor, should start radiation and chemo this week. In good news, we adopted an orange tabby rescue named Cinnamon and we're all getting used to each other. From David Gibbons, concern that my lady's dear friend of 50 years makes it out of the hospital and rehab and can back, get back home soon. She has been very ill. From Allison, we are so happy that our son Greg's spouse, Dee, successfully had some cysts removed a few weeks ago from one of their legs. They had been experiencing pain in that leg for years and finally had a doctor take it seriously. They are pain-free for the first time in about 20 years. From Michelle and Kat, a joy from Kat, the 
binaural beats seem to be making an enormous difference in how I feel. Though I still have some side effects from the chemo, they are minimal in comparison to what they were before. Yay! Uh, and more from Michelle and Kat, a second joy from Kat. I'm grateful for everyone who has volunteered to help, has sent positive words of encouragement, and inquired as to how I am. All of this is very meaningful to me. And a joy from Gail and Eric. Great music, Jay and Jessica. Jessica. <laughs> and from Julie to everyone, the air quality index has been between the high 200s to 500 due to the fires for weeks. We can't see past four houses in our neighborhood. My heart breaks for all those affected by the fires, those who have to work outside, the homeless, the animals, the wildlife praying for the firefighters and for control of the fires. <clears throat> Finally, one last stone for the hopes and hurts still too tender to escape our heart. Uh, may for the sake of love, uh, keep our doors, our hearts, our minds, and our arms open. And we remind you of our encouragement committee that you can contact while both Reverend Greg and Reverend Barbara are, are out of touch for a short period of time. Hello, everyone. I want to I want to thank you for the great music, by the way. It's um, yeah, Jay and Jessica really nice. Um, so I'm going to tell a little bit of a different story, uh, different from the story about the butterflies. And actually, maybe it's not so different because in that story, the, the birds seem to come out and do pretty well. But this is a story that has to do with birds. And it's St. Francis of Assisi's blessing of the birds. It's one of two readings that I'm going to give this morning. He said to his companions, wait for me here on the road. I'm going to speak with our sisters, the birds. And he went into the field toward the birds that were on the ground. And as soon as he began to speak, all the birds that were in the trees came down toward him and all of them stayed motionless while he spoke. He said, my little bird sisters, your creator has given you much. The freedom to fly, a double and triple covering, colorful and pretty clothing, food and singing, the realms of the air, the high mountains and hills, rocks and crags as refuges, lofty trees for your nests, clothing for your little ones. You are very loved. Take care not to be ungrateful. And when he finished his blessing, all the birds began to open their beaks, stretch out their necks, spread their wings, and bow their heads to the ground, showing by their movements and their songs that St. Francis's words gave them great pleasure. And St. Francis, noticing this, likewise rejoiced greatly in spirit with them. And then for the second reading, a very contemporary one by a poet who I believe lives, lives in Santa Cruz and has just become very recognized around the country for this wonderful short poem called Small Kindnesses. She says, her name is Danusha Lamaris. She says, um, I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull in their legs to let you by. Or how strangers still say, bless you, when someone sneezes a leftover from the bubonic plague. Don't die, we're saying. And sometimes when you spill your lemons from your grocery bag, someone else will help you pick them up. 
mostly we don't want to harm each other. We want to be handed our cup of coffee hot and to say thank you to the person handling it, handing it, to smile at them and for them to smile back. For the waitress to call you honey when she sets down the bowl of clam chowder and for the driver in the red pickup truck to let us pass. We have so little of each other now, so far from tribe and fire, only these brief moments of exchange. What, what if they are the true dwelling of the holy? These fleeting temples we make together when we say, here, have my seat. Go ahead, you first. I like your hat. Okay. Yes. Watching the black cat chickadees at the theater outside the kitchen window, the way they seem to take turns, one snatching a sunflower seed and bouncing away to a branch on the nearby lemon tree, then another comes down only to bounce away with a seed in its beak, and then another. Watching those crisp and alert little birds, I have forgotten to have my problems. Let me say that again. Watching the black cat chickadees outside my window, I have forgotten to have my problems. What a soothing, calming thought to have in a world overloaded with pandemic, job loss, isolation, divisiveness, political unrest, sleepless nights of worry, of trying to figure out the future, not just the next day, the next one, two, three weeks ahead, 
months into the future, even years, overwrought with problems. Where did they go while I was watching the chickadees? Another time or activity when I forget to have my problems is when I'm gardening. When I'm down close to the earth in the dirt with living things, planting begonias or lobelias, suddenly noticing the purple iris in bloom, for hours I can completely forget to have my problems. So take the time to reflect for a moment. Are there times or activities when you've forgotten to have your problems? I bet there are. It makes you wonder where your problems come from. What is their source? Watching the chickadees at the feeder in the kitchen window, I've forgotten to have my problems. That's sort of like a Zen koan. For those of us who might say um, a koan, I don't, I'm not sure what that is. Here are a couple of attempts at definition I found online. K-O-A-N, koan. A koan is a riddle or puzzle that Zen Buddhists use during meditation to help them unravel greater truths, unravel greater truths about the world and about themselves. Or here's another attempt. A koan is a puzzling, often paradoxical anecdote or question or verbal exchange used as an aid to meditation and a means of gaining spiritual awakening a means of gaining spiritual awakening. So watching the chickadees, I've forgotten to have my problems, is a kind of koan for me. It means it's a means of uh, gaining greater truth about myself, a means of awakening. And it helps me to be here, now, exactly where I am. There's another Zen koan, which I think is very beautiful and which I'm curious about. And it goes like this. Each branch of coral holds up the moon. Each branch of coral holds up the moon. And I first heard this koan from John Tarrant. He's a psychotherapist and Roshi, or head teacher, at the Pacific Zen Center in Santa Rosa. He grew up in Tasmania, an island state off the coast of Australia. And he talks about how as a youth, he used to go out to the Coral Sea to watch the big mother ships go by. I understand his affinity for coral, having spent much of my life uh, visiting my grandmother in Key West which is built partly on a great coral reef. I remember the coral under that transparent sea being so beautiful and so plentiful. We'd watch the angelfish, we could look down through the trans transparency of the sea to see the angelfish, uh, the brilliant parrotfish, tiny bright yellow minnow-like fish winding in and out of the coral. Every branch of coral holds up the moon. That's such a comforting thought for me. It says, we don't have to do it alone. Each branch is holding it up, whatever it is, whatever problem we might have. There are an infinitude of branches of all sorts working together to hold it up. I can feel my shoulders relax. The chickadees at my feeder, the nuthatches and the titmice, each one holds up the moon. A great weight is lifted from one's back. 
when we appreciate the gift given us here now, the gift of this life, there can be a great opening to joy and opening to light, even in the dark. In his first prime time talk, our President Biden said, finding light and darkness is a very American thing to do. Finding light and darkness is a very American thing to do. Well, I was struck by his statement in particular because I have been reading and have been in the process of rereading actually John Tarrant's book, uh, the book is called The Light Inside the Dark. It's a book which has been applauded by many. One reviewer says of John Tarrant's book that it offers us a way to gain access to the irrepressible seeds of hope, which lie barren, yet ready to bloom in fallow and dark times. His book is a book for these dark times. In one chapter, he deals with the notion of not doing or doing nothing. If I understand what he's getting at, um, at least to some extent, my moments at that sink watching the chickadees at the window were a time of not doing, not doing. Not doing is not the same thing as ordinary laziness, Tarrant writes. In ordinary laziness, we avoid something we ought to be doing. It's a process of distraction, and it takes hard work to distract ourselves from the internal commands. For instance, for me, you ought to be writing that sermon, or you ought to be doing one thing or another that you're trying to avoid. He goes on to say, uh, when we truly do nothing, a fertile, widening silence appears. We rely on the stillness that is everywhere present. When we truly do nothing, we allow that falling can be good, that arms might catch us when we do fall, that the world may sustain us. We respond naturally. I think I need help from falling because I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> I'd also like to hear my cat meow in the other room. Let me take a sip of water. So when we truly do nothing, we allow that falling can be good, that arms might catch us when we do fall that the world may sustain us. He says we respond naturally, witnessing the web of life of which we are a part. Naturally, much as water runs downhill and the white clouds run before the breeze. And I, we, I would add, uh, much in the way that the chickadees grab a sunflower seed and fly off to the lemon tree. In other words, every branch of carbon holds up the moon from the greatest to the least. We don't have to hold up the world by ourselves. We are part of that web of life. What could be more Unitarian Universalist? The interdependent of web that you use affirm and support in our principles. Tarrant goes on to say, after a certain point, Knowing and effort don't bring us into closer harmony with eternity. It's our love for fragile creatures that provides us a root. It's our love for fragile creatures that provides us a root to the harmony of eternity. The root of St. Francis of Assisi speaking with the birds. The route taken by the Japanese poet, Lisa, who concerned for the little creatures of the world writes a poem, a haiku. He says, don't worry spiders, I keep house casually. 
It is, it's the root or path or way of the interdependent web of which we are a part. The world comes to us then and we belong in it. At last we are at home in this fleeting life, Tarrant writes. The great teachers from the Western and Eastern cultures alike have a reverence for the smallest among us. All creatures of the earth and sky, as we sang this morning in the words attributed to St. Francis in that hymn. And the web of life of which we are a part, the web bespeaks of the primacy of relationships. We're all inter interwoven in this web of life, a web of relationships. It is through relationships we gain spiritual awakening. It is through relationships we unravel, unravel the truths about the world and about ourselves. In her poem, Small Kindnesses, Denusha Lomaris wonders, what if they are the true dwelling? These small kindnesses, what if, what if they are the true dwelling of the holy? These fleeting temples we make together. When we say, here, have my seat. Go ahead, you first. I like to pack. The temple in which we meet can be, but need not be a physical dwelling. The temple is within you. And the moments of meeting another are moments of awakening truths about the world and about yourself. So to find a temple inside your life, you don't have to leave your life. You find a temple in the life you have. You can start right here now. You start by welcoming, welcoming what is. Welcoming trees, welcoming chickadees, welcoming friends. We tend to resist our own lives, Tarrant says. How many universes has it taken to, give, to get each one of us right here? Here is what we have. And here, Tarrant tells us, is good enough. When you practice not doing, one of the things you're not doing is approaching relationships from the standpoint of assessing them, judging them, good or bad. Whether it is a relationship with yourself or another or, another, or the world, the beginning of awakening is not judging. It is to be curious, curious about yourself or another or the world as these relations come to you here and now. And we don't have to be experts at relationship. We're apprentices. We're all apprentices at relationship. We need not blame ourselves or the other person if we have a fight or misunderstanding. We can be curious instead. The poet Adrian Rich offers a valuable insight into human relationships. I'm quoting her and she says, an honorable human being, an honorable human, human relationship, an honorable human relationship. That is one in which two people have the right to use the word love is a process. Delicate, violent, often terrifying to both persons involved. An honorable relationship is a process of refining the truths they can tell each other. A process of refining the truths they can tell each other. That last phrase really stays with me. I'm thinking even in long-term relationships, we are apprentices. Another comforting thought. Apprentices engage in a successive refining bit by bit of the relationship. 
And the truths we tell don't have to be big truths. Little ones are good enough. <clears throat> Little ones are good enough in this in this refining process. I've been, pre I've been impressed by this idea myself. So impressed that a little poem I wrote came to me as a, a small example that I feel I've experienced in refining relationships bit by bit. It's a poem that I dedicated to Alan with whom I've been refining a relationship for some 30 years. And it's called Walking Together for Alan. He said, sorrow is a leafy green herb with a slightly sour taste. Like the seasoning he put into the fresh tuna steak and artichoke dish we had for dinner last night. I said, sorrow is a horse with a reddish brown color. Like that one over there, standing in the stable between two rows of stalls. Through the opening at the far end, you can see behind him the spring green hills and the reservoir, not very full. See the brown earth exposed at the edge. And the blue, blue, unlike any other, of the Northern California sky. This is what matters. Telling small truths about ourselves to each other, little by little, refining our re friendship, refining our love. It's curious, um, in the brief exchange, which I tried to capture in my poem, perhaps he and I together did make a fleeting temple, a dwelling of the holy. And even more curious, we were not doing. We we're not doing anything much at all. Start by welcoming. Here is what we have. And here is good enough. So be it. Join together in singing the closing hymn, 123, Spirit of Life. <coughs> Please join me in reciting our chalice extinguishing words, which will appear on our screen shortly. 
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. In closing, in this time of darkness, may we do what our president says we Americans are good at, finding light. May we welcome times when the smallest among us helps us to forget our problems. May we take comfort in the interdependent web of life that is there to catch us if we fall. May we be curious about the things we do, ourselves, relationships, and the world. Let us remember that here is what we have, and here is good enough. And let us not forget kindness. Let us be kind to all the creatures, great and small. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining our service today. Uh, we'll be starting our Zoom uh, breakout rooms next. I've um, given everybody the ability to unmute themselves at this point. So uh, let me uh, spin some dials here and um, spin some dials and send you off to um, a breakout room. Mm -hmm.